ophthalmology. Um, and uh, it's great to start our year out. Okay. It's great to start our year out by talking about uh, the Moran Corps and the Eccles Health Sciences Library, a resource for your practice and for your uh, scholarship uh, for the coming year. Uh, so I want to acknowledge all the people on the library committee, uh, Brian Jones, uh, Griffin you're going to hear from, Muriel Young, Nico, Brian Kilo, uh, Becca Gentier, uh, Rachel Jacoby, William Barlow, Jeff Petty, and then all of the staff from Moran, Ann Brady, Barbara Curris, uh, uh, Elaine Peterson, Ethan Peterson, Elizabeth Neff, Lindsay <coughs> Danino, and then our tremendous Eccles Hill Science Library partners, uh, which is Christy Jarvis and Nancy Lombardo. And you're going to be hearing a lot from Christy today about all the new resources that take place in the library. I'm not sure where this is. Uh, so we're going to start out with Christy giving us an update on the library, and then we're going to be doing an overview of Moran Corps. And I think you're going to be very pleased about all the new things that we have in the Moran Corps. Uh, currently. Now, Christy has been with us for many, many years uh, on the library committee. She's the associate, associate Director of Scholarly Communications at Eccles Health Sciences Library. She's the person I've been working with to ensure that we have licenses to books, journals, databases, tools for our teaching, education, and patient care. And we go through every single journal uh, in ophthalmology uh, every late summer, early fall and decide um, how we're going to move forward with it. And uh, we ask Christy to come uh, every year because there are so many new things happening in publishing and in scholarship, and you need to stay up to date with this information. So Christy, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, guys. I uh, really appreciate you inviting me back again. Um, as Dr. DeVree mentioned, um, every year I'm invited to come and speak to you about library resources. For the past couple of years, I have focused on resources in terms of books, databases, and journals. And I'm going to touch on those briefly at the end, but I really wanted to spend some time today talking about the people resources, the people in the Eccles Health Sciences Library, who we are, what we do. Um, and what I'm hoping that you take away from this part of my presentation is um, having learned at least one thing that the library can do that will make your life easier. Hey, I doubt people come here very often to say, I'm here to make your life easier, and I'm not selling you anything. There's just resources that are available that I want you to know about. Um, so the Echoes Library, who are we? These are some of my colleagues that work in the CRED team, which is the Clinical Research and Education Support. Um, so a very talented group of people. Some of the things that we do, some of the roles that we play, you may not be aware of. Obviously, we're librarians. Um, we are educators. We do a lot of um, instruction across the health sciences, schools and colleges, teaching evidence-based practice. Um, we are researchers ourselves. We undertake our own research projects. Um, we are lit searchers and we are expert, experts at finding information. So what is it that we do? I have a feeling that some of these slides may be somewhat surprising to you. The first thing I'm going to talk about um, what it is that the library does is improve patient care. Um, I've thrown up some statistics from a study that we've done recently that involved 118 hospitals and about 17,000 providers um, that for a year had librarians performing clinical searches. And throughout the course of that one year study, 50% of the providers in the study changed the advice given to patients and families. So you're talking about 7,000, no, what's half of 17,000? 8,500. Um, physicians changed the information that they gave to patients and family based on having an information expert um, undertake the clinical search. 30% of them it influenced the choice of treatment um, or choice of drug therapy. 25% uh, it, it impacted their, their diagnosis or changed the choice of tests. So when you consider how large of a provider population that is and the number of patients that they see, there is a huge um, ripple, ripple effect um, on patients. And there is a growing body of literature that supports this idea, and it is becoming compelling enough um, that the library is having conversations with CMIO of the hospital, who um, sometime in the coming year you are likely to see embedded within EPIC um, an option to have a, li a clinical librarian um, perform information searches um, to improve patient care. 
So that's just something to keep an eye on, um, that you may not be aware that the library is already involved in this type of work and it's likely to expand, um, and that there are people that can help you um, track down the information you need for patient care. This is just a slide in case you're interested in reading a bunch of articles about this later. Um, and as a good librarian, I have to show my references. Um, another thing that we do is provide tailored search results. Now, if I were a gambling person, I would put all my money on the fact that these are the two resources that you search most frequently. Is that true? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, how many of you think that PubMed is an exhaustive resource? Oh good, no hands. Okay, it's not. Um, but do you know what it is that it is searching? And perhaps more importantly, do you know what resources it is not searching? Maybe not. Librarians do. Um, up to date, same thing. Very robust resource, not exhaustive. Um, there is a lot of information contained in the world of biomedical literature that is not found in either of these resources. Um, the library currently provides access to 350 databases. I don't expect you to know what is in each of them, let alone the nuances of how to effectively search each one. That's what the library is for. We spend a lot of our time swimming in this world. You don't. Um, I work with people who are, quite frankly, much better librarians than you are, for the same reason you're a much better ophthalmologist than we are. That's what you spend your time doing. You train to do it. You do it all the time. And you just become familiar with, with patterns. So, what I want you to take away from this is um, PubMed and UpToDate are phenomenal places to start your search. They may not be the place that you want to end your search. Um, in addition to these just few um, databases that I picked out to highlight and that universe of another 300 plus, um, those are only uh, <laughs> going to find resources that are controlled by commercial publishers. Beyond that, there's a whole nother universe of gray literature. Um, I worked with providers and found the information they were looking for was buried in a data table on a clinical trial. You're not going to find that by searching any of these resources. So librarians can help you figure out what place to search that's most likely to contain the information that you're looking for. And quite frankly, that's not the best use of your time. Um, your job is to take the research findings and apply them in clinical practice. But the amount of time that you may want to spend digging up that research um, finding, there are people who can do that faster and more effectively than you can. So that's one way that I would like to you stress that the library can help make your life easier. Something else that the library can help you do is to facilitate research and publishing. Um, the library can help you find source materials for systematic reviews, and the library has a team of people that can actually help you throughout many stages of an entire systematic review process. We can help you find source material for grant proposals, IACOC and IRB proposals, and help you manage, store, and share your research data. Um, on the publishing side, we can help recommend publications that are appropriate for your topic and likely to be interested in what it is that you are writing about. Um, and find reputable journals to publish your work in, manage your citations, and help you avoid predatory publishers. So when I put this slide together, I was thinking about which one of these things I wanted to spend a few minutes diving into. I'm not going to dive into most of them. Um, and I've decided I'm going to talk a little bit about predatory publishers. And the reason for that is over the past year, the library has probably fielded 50 questions from researchers across the health sciences who have either been duped into publishing with a predatory publisher or have concern about, um, about being duped into publishing with a predatory publisher. So very quickly, what is a predatory publisher? Um, there's not an agreed upon definition. Here are some samples. What they all have in common is exploiting. These are unethical publishers who are trying to exploit all of your work for financial gain and not for the benefit of the scientific community. Oh, I forgot there's an important part of this. Predatory publishers are better talking about <laughs> with a pirate hat on. Um, so, and I have an eye patch, but I didn't have time to put that on. Just imagine I'm wearing one. Um, so predatory publishers are, are exploiting your work. And really what they are exploiting is the open access publishing model, um, where open access publishing charges you for services that they provide. Predatory publishers charge you and then don't provide the services. So. 
open access publishing, for those that aren't as familiar with it, um, flips the model of instead of having um, users pay to read the content, you pay to publish the content and then everyone can read it. And you pay to publish and for that fee, um, the publisher provides certain services like editorial fees, peer reviewing, archiving, indexing, and retraction services. Predatory publishers don't provide any of those, all of which are problematic, but the one that I'm going to focus on is what happens when they don't uh, apply any peer review. So I hopefully don't have to convince anyone in this room of the value of peer review, but it exists to ensure the quality of the research, to spot errors before they're published. Um, and so what do you think happens when publishers just skip this process? Um, here are some famous examples of predatory publishers that have published things that clearly did not go through peer review. There's the homogenous configurations by Margaret Simpson, Kim Jong Fun, and Edna Crabapple. There was the paper that was submitted by the Center for Research and Applied Phrenology, or CRAP. And my favorite, Pinkerton LeBrain and Orson G. Wells, who published Cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, that was accepted by 17 medical journals. So, I have had more, several researchers, let me say, um, that have said to me, well, Christy, I don't really care, or why should I care if a publisher is not um, putting my manuscript through peer review? I know that my paper on diabetic retinopathy is founded on robust research and it's legitimate. That may be true, but do you want it to appear in a journal next to Cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs? Probably not. It undermines the legitimacy of your paper. So, um, why are they a problem? Well, ask yourself why it is that you publish. Most people don't publish for the love of writing up their research. Um, they publish to enhance their reputation, get recognized for the work, increase visibility. Um, they're also a problem because if you submit a paper to a predatory publisher and it gets published, by which I mean just uploaded to the web, um, you now cannot submit it to a more legitimate journal to be published. It's already been published. So you're, you're narrowing your options for having it um, included in a more legitimate publication. Um, it can negatively impact your academic career, and it perpetuates bad science. So there are a lot of reasons to try and stay away from predatory publishers. There are some red flags, um, the big one being <laughs> uh, once you've been in academia for a not even very long um, period of time, predatory publishers will have scraped your email address from the web, and you will start getting overly flattering, I mean disgustingly <laughs> flattering emails. If I had a dollar for every time, I have been called esteemed. In, in ridiculous English. Esteemed and <laughs> most, yeah. And I cut them all out and hang them on my fridge so my husband can see how amazing I am. <laughs> Everyone knows that I'm esteemed and, you know, eminent in my field. Um, most publishers do not need to solicit submissions. They may solicit a particular editorial or review on a topic that they know you're an expert um, on. But just submitting or just soliciting submissions rarely needs to happen. Um, most publishers have the volume of submissions has doubled in the past five years for most publishers. They're they're drowning in manuscripts. They're not really um, going to come to you begging for you to submit. Um, so just those overly solicitous, flattering emails um, are a huge red flag. There are lots of others. Um, they tend to have very broad scopes, um, no, no legitimate um, archiving or indexing policy, lots of things. There is a checklist that I'm not going to go through um, other than to say that these are some of the things that the library looks at, is the transparency, the fees, the copyright policy, the peer review policy, the quality of the website and the publication, the indexing, and then a lot of it is just judgment calls. Um, once you have been seeing lots of patients with a similar condition, you develop a sort of pattern recognition. There's something that just sticks out that doesn't look right. The same thing is true for those of us that spend way, way more time than we'd like to in the publishing world. Um, there are a lot of things that just right off the bat don't feel right. Um, but if you have suspic suspicions, you have concerns, you want some advice or guidance, ask a librarian. This is something that the library does a lot of, is stirring people away from predatory publishers. Um, so that is hopefully something that you will take away from this as ask the library to help you with so you don't get sucked into um, publishing with a predatory journal. Unfortunately, if you do get sucked in, it is extremely difficult to do anything about it. Just like there are predatory publishers who will list people's names. There was a publisher once that I called 
someone on the editorial board to ask about her experience with the publisher, and she's like, I didn't know I was on the editorial board. I mean, not, I mean, they just, you know, drag in people's names. Um, so that is something that the library can help you with um, so that you keep your record of scholarship in legitimate channels. To just point out, a lot of them will have almost the same name of a legitimate oh, yeah. publisher. Yes, they will. It was just a slight wording change. Yeah. Yes. Yes. How do you, uh, can, is there any way of having them stop sending you a lot of email? Or are you going to cover that later? No, there's not. Um, there's actually a team of researchers, I think in Toronto, two or three years ago, who took on the task of, I think they did it for 18 months or two years, they went through every unsubscribe, blocking option, um, and I can't remember, um, I should have included this slide, um, but they calculated the number of hours they spent doing that, and at the end of the whole study, they reduced the amount of spam email they were getting by a whopping 17%. So it really wasn't worth the effort that they put into it. Um, the predatory filters are pretty persistent. Yeah, and, and, and you can, I mean, they will switch domain names, they will, I mean, they're, they're pretty adept. Um, getting into your inbox. The only thing I can say is just make liberal use of your delete key. Unfortunately. Was there someone else that... No. Okay. I am going to talk quickly about a couple of key resources beyond just the people um, in the library. Um, full text in PubMed. I talk about this every year because it's so important. Um, um, I have found that when we do, the library does a lot of instruction with students um, and trainees, um, the finding the literature part, being able to search PubMed, being able to search the databases to find the literature is a fairly straightforward process. But then there's the finding the full text, which is a whole nother, whole nother issue. Um, so the two things that I want to stress for those particularly who are new here is that there is no full text in PubMed. PubMed, PubMed is a citation database. Um, there are publishers that will put links to their website to get content. Um, almost every time, that's going to send you to a place where the publisher is like, oh, would you like this article? It will only cost you $90. Um, so the way you can get access to all of the content that the library subscribes to through PubMed is one of two ways. You can either use the link to PubMed that you can find on the library's website or is included in this slide. Um, you'll notice in the URL it has that you Utah live at the end. That takes you to an interface of PubMed that has all of the library's resources linked to it. Um, so that's one way you can see what you, what you have full text access to. The other one is if you, are, if you like to sign into PubMed using your, your My NCBI account, um, you want to go into your My NCBI preferences and choose the Eccles Health Sciences Library as your outside tool. And then if you use your NCBI account when you log into PubMed, that will also bring in all of the library's full text. So, very important. If you are in PubMed, um, this is just showing where the link to the library's PubMed is on our homepage. Um, you will know that you are accessing the library's resources in PubMed if you see that find it swirly icon um, next to every abstract in PubMed. It'll be next to every abstract whether we have the full text or not. Um, but that's going to help you find all the places that the library has full text. Okay. So if you click on that little swirly find it button in PubMed, it takes you to our catalog where you will see a list with hyperlinks of all of the places that we have full text access to that article. <coughs> it's very common for us to have five or six places where we have access to that same article. The reason that may be important is that uh, maybe Elsevier's website is down, but we have it through some other aggregator. Um, if we don't have it, when you click on that find it link, it brings you to the catalog and it tells you no full text available and then down here at the bottom where it says additional services you can request an article so you can order the article through interlibrary loan which does not cost you anything um, you click on that um, request an article you pick the library that you're affiliated with you log into Iliad which is separate from your university ID and password you do have to create an Iliad account um, but you log into Iliad the citation information of the article you were just looking at is pre-populated you order it um, and it's sent to you in about, so our interlibrary loan department says within 24 hours, to be honest, they're usually in six hours or less, um, sometimes even faster than that. So any questions about full text in PubMed? Any issues, complaints people are having accessing full text? 
This is really uh, very helpful. I don't know how many of you have used this, uh, but very, very helpful because we don't subscribe to every single journal. We, when we look at journals, we look to see how many people are using the journal, and then uh, if there's only one or two for the year, we may not subscribe to that journal, but uh, you need the library loan to get the article. Yeah, and there are also and the key is to do it through the University of Utah website yes. to get PubMed rather than going PubMed directly. Right? Yes. yes, yeah, because if you just go to generic PubMed, you'll find the citations, and instead of that find it link next to it, so you can see underneath my arrow, it says full text Elsevier. The publisher will put their link there, yeah, and it'll okay. send you to the publisher's website. Um, if we subscribe to that journal directly from the publisher, and you happen to be on the university's network, maybe you'll get full text. Those are a lot of ifs. If you go through the library's portal, you'll see all the places that we could get it. And if you're not on the network, when you try and access it, it will ask you to log in, so it verifies that you're part of the university, and then it will take you to the article. Um, the other thing is, is that there are lots and lots and lots of journals that we subscribe to not in a one-on-one -on -one relationship with the publisher. There are lots of packages that are aggregated, um, so if you just you know, Google search the journal article name and just go to the journal website. I hear this all the time, but how can you not have Retina? Well, we probably do, well, we do, um, but it may not be at the Retina website. It may be on a third-party aggregator platform um, that if you went through PubMed or if you went through the library's catalog will take you to the right place. So just because you go to the publisher's website and you can't get an article doesn't mean that the library doesn't have access. The best way, honestly, is to search in PubMed and follow that link. You said that there was another way to go to NCBI and add the Eccles mm -hmm. Library there. Can you can you show us where that that is? Or yeah. is okay. So if, do you have a my NCBI account? So it, it you just want to click on the where it says settings, and settings is a whole okay. long okay. thing. It's where you can pick you know your highlighting options and all of that. Okay. It's like halfway to maybe two thirds of the way down that long list. It says outside tool. And it's just a drop down, um, and you can scroll down it, and you will find. And I think it says University of Utah, comma Eccles Health Sciences Library, and then you save that, and then every time you use your My NCBI account, you will be accessing the library's resources. Okay. Okay. Um, so new resources. Oh no. Nope. Well, you better do the LCS. easy proxy. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So I like to throw this in here because I really, really hope that sometimes you're not here. Sometimes you're at home, sometimes you're on vacation, you're not on the university's network. So all of our publishers grant access to their resources based on your IP address. That's a whole thing in publishing that is evolving and may likely may change in the future, but for now, it's your IP address that is what lets the publisher either say, uh-uh, you're not affiliated with anyone who pays for content, you can't get in, or open the gates, you have access. So. When you are on campus on a computer that is connected to the university's network. So sometimes I have people say, well, Christy, I'm on campus. And I'm like, yes, but you're using your phone that is connected to a cell tower somewhere. The publisher doesn't know that you're physically standing on campus. So if you are here and you're using a university network, um, when you go to access a publisher's resource, they identify who you are and they let you in. When you're not here or when you're not on the network, um, you have to use a remote access method. It's a way of letting the publisher know, yes, I am part of the University of Utah, so everything that we pay for, please let me have access to. So one method is to use the Easy Proxy server, um, which you can access on the library's homepage and scattered throughout our website is this little key that says off-campus access. If you click on that, you'll be prompted for this lovely screen to put in your unit and password, and then it will always after you have signed in, route you right back to where you were, and you will see in the address bar that easyproxy.lib.utah.edu. That, that is associated with an IP address that now when you go to a publisher site, they're like, yes, that is a University of Utah IP, please come on in. Um, you will stay signed into that proxy server for as long as your web browser session stays open. If you close it, you have to sign back in. Um, so that is one option. Another option is to download the VPN software onto your device. You can get this from the Office of Software Licensing. Um, and if you go that route, then you can, on your device, just sign into the VPN, and then wherever you go throughout your day, you will have put yourself on the university network, and that is what publishers will see. 
So two different ways to go about it. Um, I will tell you that most of the library's resources, if you access them either from our website or from the catalog or from PubMed, if you are off campus or off the university network, we have embedded the proxy prompt. So it will often, if you try and get to the article, um, it will say, oh, are you part of the University of Utah? And if you put in your unit and password, then it passes you on. So we've tried to embed that as many places as we're able so that in case you forget, um, it gives you a little, a little prompt. OK, a couple of new resources. Um, the one that I wanted to highlight is the library recently added JAMA Evidence. Um, it has the online copies of User's Guide to the Medical Literature, Rational Clinical Examination, Care at the Close of Life. Um, it has a massive library of podcasts um, that are all about evidence-based medicine. So if you're someone that likes to listen to um, audio, it's a great, great collection. Um, and then I threw up a picture. One of the other really useful resources on JAMA evidence, I think, particularly for trainees and early career people and some mid or late, this is <laughs> always good, um, to focus on improving your critical appraisal skills. There is a library of critical appraisal worksheets um, that if you are trying to strengthen your skills in critical analysis as you are reading studies, there are worksheets for different types of studies, um, different types of publications that prompt you with questions that over time are things that will become second nature to you that you will just start asking yourself um, when you are reading articles. Um, but they're a really good training tool to get you into the habit um, of becoming a critical reader um, and being able to analyze and appraise the literature. So I wanted to mention that. Um, how do you get those? How do you get them? So JAMA Evidence is on the library's homepage. There is, well, it's not very large, but above where it says. Can um, you use the pointer so we can see from the slides? Oh, maybe it's you may have to use the um, the mouse pointer. Oh, oh nope, I got, got it. Okay. okay. So, right here where, no. Oh. You just advance it. It also advances the slide. Oh. Hit that one. Okay. There's the lots of buttons slide. on this. Use the mouse one. There. So can I, can I even show the mouse on here? You just have to move the mouse and it'll come awake. Usually. No. And it's not this way. Use the old fashioned way and go up to the screen okay. and point at it. Finger. <laughs> oh, I'm on call. Oh, wait. Okay. Right here where it says research databases. <laughs> okay. If you click on that, that is an alphabetical A to Z list of all of you know when I said we have 358 databases, that's the list of all of them. And if you go under J, there is a link for JAM evidence. I don't um, and so if you click on, if you click on that, um, if you're off, off the network, it will prompt for your unit and password and then it lets you into JAMA Evidence. So the, there are a couple of tools in JAMA Evidence that you are able to use, but you have to create a free My Access account first. There are lots of slides. If you are teaching any evidence-based practice, you do not have to create slides from, from scratch. There is a beautiful library of slides that you can download and use. Um, and then there is also this library of critical appraisal worksheets. Um, and you can, you can select one that you want. You can fill it out online, or you can download it and print it out and just have it next to you while you're reading. Um, the podcasts, you can also, um, from JAMA Evidence, click on the JAMA uh, evidence-based practice podcast and you can either pick ones you want to listen to or just like any podcast you can subscribe you can subscribe to it um, and get new I think they release new um, episodes twice a week I think is how often they do it um, okay so that's gem evidence and then I just quickly wanted to talk about some of the reasons you might want to physically come to the library I know I know everything is done virtually <laughs> in, the, in the cloud, um, but there is some interesting and useful, I think, tools that are physically located in the library. Um, the first one is we have a virtual reality sandbox. If you're interested in talking to some of our staff, if you have an idea for a virtual reality project um, that you want to explore, there are people that can help you with that. 
Um, there is also a one button audio video studio. So if you are interested in lecture capture or if you want to record a podcast, um, we've had people come in to record patient education videos. Um, I've been told that it, it is truly as simple as pushing one button, um, but there are staff that can help you as well. Um, it's set up with microphones and cameras and backdrops and, and all of that. Um, so you're welcome to come. The, what the studio is something you probably would want to contact the library and make a reservation. You don't have to, but just that way you can ensure that it's available um, when you come over. Um, why else you might want to use a library? We have treadmill desks and bikes. So um, I'm a person that tends to come in pretty early. I'm usually in the library at about five in the morning. Um, and it's amazing how many providers also come in that early and catch up on email and do some reading while they're getting some exercise in. Um, we also have free yoga during lunch on Wednesdays and Fridays. This is partly, I think, to try and counter, um, so the library, um, like most health sciences departments, is on board with the university's wellness initiative. Um, but the library also fairly recently for health sciences students and trainees, so residents and fellows, this applies to you, um, is open 24 seven. Um, so on the one hand, we felt like we were trying to say, yes, you should take care of your health and, and have a balanced life, but we're gonna be open around the clock. <laughs> um, so, so we added treadmill desks and yoga, I think, so that we didn't feel so guilty about it. Um, but again, if you are a resident or fellow and you are interested, the library, like I said, with your badge, you can get in 24 seven. Um, it does have security cameras and there's a guard. Um, so it's a fairly quiet and safe place. If you really have to study at four o'clock in the morning, which I hope you don't, you should go home and see your family. Okay, um, last thing is getting help. Um, this is just <coughs> access information for the library. Um, library hours, we are staffed Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., Saturday, 10 to 6, and Sunday, we're not staffed. Um, like I said, if you're a trainee, though, the building is open 24 seven, and the Bloomberg Library here is open 24 hours as well, so you have access to that. Does anyone have any questions before I turn things over for, to Griffin? And the Moran Corps. Randy. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so uh, you're talking about clinical questions, and, and indeed there may be a, a link that's going to be occurring in our mm -hmm. electronic medical record. Typically, how long does that take to get a reply back? Because often that's the, the one issue is the timeliness. Yeah, so um, when the link for a request goes live in Epic, my understanding is that there's going to be a uh, like a tiering system in terms of priority. Like, I'm in with a patient right now versus this patient has just left, they're coming back in two weeks and I need to, you know, get more information before I see them again. Um, so I don't have a definitive answer to that yet. Partly it depends on, um, my understanding is that Dr. Hightower wants to roll out the service to a limited group first um, and then see how scalable it is and to see how many staff might be needed to meet the demands, if, if most of the demands are for more or less immediate response, um, then it will probably will be scaled up more slowly so that staff can have a chance to get caught. So, it's, a, so it's, a, it's obviously evolving as well as we. Yes. One of the things is that uh, a lot of us, uh, if we do any editorial review work or we're on editorial boards and the rest, uh -huh. it's, it's so pervasive uh, for us in ophthalmology that, that Elsevier is involved in some of that. <coughs> And we get immediate access to Scopus. How, how good do you feel Scopus is as far as? So Scopus is very good, just like UpToDate and other tools, though. You have to understand the, I mean, it's not comprehensive. So the content that it has is high quality and very reliable. It's just, it doesn't have everything. So I mean, right now, I mean, if, if we have two minutes, so what do most of you do? If you search up to date and you search PubMed and you don't find your answer, what do you do? Do you stop? No, I call the librarian. Call <laughs> she gets a gold star. <laughs> um, I mean, do you find a colleague? Do you? I have to just say, to this library resource, if you go to the reference, um, I have asked for lots of things, uh, and I usually get it within 24 to 48 hours or something like that, and, um, and it's really helpful. Right. I mean, sometimes the, the amount of time it takes depends on how far down the rabbit hole we're going to have to go. I mean, I, like I said, I, I have 
helped providers find information that was you know, buried in the data, the data table of a clinical trial registry. I mean, like, it, there are places in the gray literature, so the gray literature is anything that is out there in the biomedical literature that is not controlled by a commercial publisher, and there's tons of it. Um, so the library is probably more quickly than you are able to identify three or four likely places, but then you may be digging for a while. So sometimes the response rate depends on how, how far, how obscure, um, how obscure it is. Yeah. More questions? Uh -huh. Yeah, so, so I found, you know, occasionally there are times where you're doing research and you're not even really crystal clear on the question. And so um, it's helpful. In, in other places, I've, I've uh, met with librarians just to help me kind of think of other things I should be looking at yeah. to refine my question. Is, the, is that possible? Yeah. Yeah, so the question has to do with <laughs> How do you even know if you're asking the right question? How, how do you clarify the question to get the information that you may not even know that you need? Um, so that is part of a conversation to have with a librarian um, to help you define the question. So the Marriott and Eccles libraries jointly have an evidence synthesis team that does a lot of um, systematic reviews, scoping reviews, meta-analyses, that type of thing, and has a, I don't know if I call it a method, a, a practice. Um, to try and get at that very question. How do you, how do you create a good research question? Um, I don't know if that Yeah, it does. Addresses I mean, your... sometimes, you know, I can give an example. We were trying to develop a, 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 a work, there are different images that would help patients post uh, scleral buccal surgery for retinal detachment define what they were seeing, because many times they had good visual acuity, but they weren't happy. Right. And, and we didn't have enough like terms in our language to be able to describe some of the things that our visual system does. So, so you know, that was, this was at another place I was, but we met with a librarian who came up with searches that were totally different than ones that we had thought of. Yeah. And I was wondering if that was here as well. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Search, search, search strategies. Business. Search strategies. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Search strategies and uh, keywords and uh, systematic reviews. I mean, this is a resource that uh, all of us in academia need. I mean, if we're going to be uh, performing scholarly publishing or reviews or whatever, it's really helpful. Right. I, I wish that there were a simple, straightforward Google search for everything in the biomedical literature, but there's not, and I don't think there ever will be. So at least for now, having a team of librarians who are expert information navigators um, I, I think is helpful and hopefully a huge time saver for you. Um, yeah. Last question before we, I want to, Christy, it, Christy is our resource. Uh, she's our ambassador from the Eccles Health Sciences Library to the Bloomberg Library. She attends all of our meetings, works with the library committee. So she's the go-to person for journals and information. Yeah. This is right. Or basically, I mean, you can ask me anything, and if I'm not the right person, I'll connect you with someone yeah. who is. So thank you, Christy. Okay. Thank you, guys. All right. Thank you. So, uh, so next, um, so I want to mention Nancy Lombardo. As you know, she is uh, um, head of digital publishing at the Eccles Health Sciences Library, and she is the person who I worked with to establish the novel library, the Neuroophthalmology Virtual Education Library, and then we tapped into her expertise to get the Moran Corps going. She won a merit award from NANOS, the North American Neuroophthalmology Society, and an award from the Medical Library Association for all her work. Um, she's working on uh, work-life balance this week and um, has, to, it has to be on a river trip. Um, but I, I want to introduce uh, Griffin Jardine, who really stepped into a, the role as editor-in-chief of the Moran Corps. And so I'm going to have let uh, Griffin give you an update on what has happened with Moran Corps over this last year. Yeah. Thanks, Christy. Um, that was a great presentation. Uh, I, I didn't have a costume today, but I did decide to dye my hair an exotic color to make it more interesting. So the um, so. Um, so Moran Corps, I think everyone here is pretty familiar with it. I want to just review just some basics and then talk about some changes we're making and hopefully have a little discussion with everyone here 
just about any ideas you've had you have from the presentation or from working with uh, this resource. But um, it's as we just heard a collaboration between us and the Eccles Health Sciences Library. Um, and uh, it's really meant to highlight all the great work that we're doing here and put it into a format that is accessible to trainees and ophthalmologists around the world. Um, the, uh, the, I think what's made it initially so successful, and I actually was talking to dermatology who was also looking to do something similar uh, in, the, in their department, and they, you know, so much of ophthalmology is uh, de-identified pictures. I mean, the picture of a retina has no identifying feature. So uh, we're really unique in being able to do this. Dermatology essentially couldn't, couldn't uh, make almost any progress in it. But what we've been able to do is use this as a capturing tool. And I have to give a shout out to Ethan. Um, I think Ethan's here. Is he here? Um, so Ethan and then also Christy and Nancy for recording lectures, recording grand rounds, getting them up to, uh, you know, posted and organized on the website. That's I mean, so actually an enormous amount of work. So without really us as a department having to do much differently besides just let this capturing tool work, we've put a ton of the information, lectures, high quality uh, um, didactics here for, you know, essentially you know, any, anybody learning ophthalmology around the world to have access to. Um, the, uh, this is the, the home page. Uh, a couple of changes we've made recently in the last year. Um, we restructured some of the buttons down here. This resident lectures button is new, and uh, um, I think... And then the general ophthalmology. Oh yeah, and I'll get to that. Yeah, sorry, I, just, I didn't say that. But, uh, um, so now when you, when you go to the resident lecture button, you have this list of, by division, all the lectures that we're already giving. So this is essentially a lecture series for a residency program uh, you know, in, in some uh, developing country that just doesn't have this sort of material. Uh, and it's got every lecture that, you know, as you I'll give for an example, the, you know, our fantastic um, ophthalmic pathology lectures by you know, Liliana and Nick um, now are kind of organized and we've got the year so you can see how up to date they are. Uh, and this is, I just think, a great resource. Um, the, uh, we'll, I'll come back to this as kind of some uh, ways that we can use it for the future. Um, and then the, uh, looking at this, the side panel on that main website, some other new things, this basic ophthalmology review. Uh, in the last couple of years, we've, uh, it's pretty much completed. We've got a, a resource now for either medical students, off, you know, early ophthalmologists in training or non-ophthalmologists. I, I, I don't know if, does anyone here had a, a, a non-ophthalmologist, like an emergency medicine doctor or primary care doctor, ask them, how to use a tonal pen, or how to do motility testing. I think these are common questions that we get, and they are all on here um, and uh, it, it, on this basic ophthalmology review, basic diseases and then basic eye exam techniques. Ultrasound, again, just another way to capture the great work we have. Dr. Harry, who has uh, just is such a, uh, a resource here, we're capturing what he's doing, and then some other kind of catch-all topics that we cover in Grand Rounds. Um, so going back to the basic, basic ophthalmology review, um, so, you know, intraocular pressure, there's actually a video here that walks you through what our medical students did who was rotating through a couple years ago on what the numbers mean on the tonal pen, how you do it. Um, I believe Chris Baer is the patient who, you know, gave his eye for, to donate for, for research in the, in the project. The, uh, so we've got uh, just an, an organized by exam and then an anatomical approach to eye disease on topics. Um, I think there was, I was at a primary care doctor appointment and I actually told them about this resource because they were asking about how, uh, how to have, there's just such a, there's not really great resources for non-ophthalmologists about the eye. I think almost all the educational materials that we put out as a, as a field are targeted towards ophthalmologists and that's been a big issue in ophthalmology is that we're kind of losing uh, you know, we're, we're losing the battle and teaching all of our other colleagues about uh, basic eye diseases. Um, here's an example submission on the direct ophthalmoscope that also has a video that walks you through how to use it. So, um, hey, there you go. There's our wonderful trainee there. Um, so, um, and then a number of videos have been put out. I wanted to highlight this one. Um, did I see Judith here? Yeah. So, so Judith, uh, this video on the neuro ophthalmology exam is our number one with 
uh, over half a million views. So when you, when you type in on YouTube the neuroophthalmology exam, this website is linked to um, our Moran, or the, the, the Moran Core website. Is, uh, we, we give YouTube open access to all of our videos. And what's interesting, just typing a neuroophthalmology exam, look at this. The first, uh, the top four hits, three of them come off the Moran Core. Which is, and getting in YouTube, getting to be the first video to come up actually is pretty, uh, there's, there's, it's pretty complicated, um, and it, 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 it is a function of popularity. Um, that's the right word. I mean, that's, you know, getting a lot, having a lot of views. But um, pretty, pretty exciting. So we, we, we can't help ourselves but go over the statistics. Um, the, uh, the numbers are amazing. I mean, they, I mean that, that just, it, people talk with their fingers like they talk with their feet, and people obviously like this. I mean, uh, yeah, it's, it's amazing. 163 countries this last year have, have accessed this. The new user numbers? It's, yeah, staying the same. Every year we're, we're almost 90% new people looking at it. Um, the, uh, and you look at the, the page views went from 6,000 to 75,000. And this is for the Moran Core website. Um, the YouTube statistics, this is when we opened it up. Um, so, the, so all the videos were exclusively accessed through Moran Core, and then we opened up the YouTube channel so that they could be searched in YouTube. And it went from 70,000 one quarter to 2.6 million. Um, uh, in terms of watch time of minutes, um, so only almost 10 million minutes in 2018. If you look at this, the numbers are actually a little bit down. We, we think that's probably a function of putting all this information out there, but then not having as much new content. And in order to stay um, relevant in YouTube, you kind of have to keep putting up new videos. And so just a little plug for putting your surgical videos and other things that you're doing on the brand core uh, to, to, to kind of keep this mo momentum going. Um, what, what's pretty unique too, you think about the, the attention span of the 2019 uh, average individual and um, our, our average view duration is somewhere between you know, f four, six, seven minutes, which is, uh, I think that's keeping people on the website for a, a reasonable amount of time, or, or keeping the people's attention in these videos. Um, so here you can see just essentially any, any country that's, so the white countries are the ones that we, that we don't have, people haven't viewed it, so it's I mean, quite worldwide in terms of people accessing the, the website. Um, so I'll, I'll skip over these, but this slide is just to make a point that you can do all sorts of different formats. You can do an image report, which is, uh, you know, so, so much of our imaging department, or so much of the purpose of this was to capture all the wonderful work that our imaging department has done. I have to thank Jim, too, who's really given a lot of his images to this website um, and, and just showcasing that fantastic work. But case reports, surgical videos, grand rounds, resin lectures, we, we are trying to have all of these um, captured in, in the website. So kind of last couple of key points here. Um, hopefully it's not a surprise to you if your name is on this <laughs> list. Um, the, uh, the editorial board, we've decided that it's gonna just, it's gonna take a, a big team effort to get each of these subsections populated. So we have, each section has an, edi um, an editor, um, and if, is Megan here, Megan C? Yeah. Um, so, so I'm trying to meet with each of these editors uh, over the next year or so, and, and Megan and I met, and she looked at her website, or at her specific subsection, and made a number of changes. I'm just curious, Megan, if you could share your experience or thoughts on how you felt like it, you know, your role as an editor was, and what you've been able to do. Um, so mainly it's just organizing things, because the content, due to Kathleen's amazing work, was pretty much already there, but I changed I made a core section to where residents and students can uh, look at core uh, videos that are on topics that like diplopia or vision loss, and then they can watch those and then go to uh, something like a flipped classroom, so where they get the content before and then they go to a lecture and it's more going over cases, so they've already had the material and then they can apply it to a lecture. So that's kind of the first thing I did, and then it's going through and filling in each subsection with appropriate videos. Yeah, and it's, I mean, you've already, you know, significantly enhanced that section and making it um, more succinct and concise and to the point, and, uh, as well as just um, organized. So thank you, Megan. Um, so, we're so we're hoping to kind of do this with each section. 
Um, the, uh, this is just an example of neuro ophthalmology showing you, you know, on the exam here, you get to see all these videos, all these have to, and um, uh, what a great resource that is. Um, I, may, I may, just as we're short on time, skip through some of the publication process. Um, just to keep, keep one, so, you know, everything's peer reviewed, so we all, we kind of peer review every, you know, every submission. Um, we have all, all the links on the website that uh, give you the template of how to fill it out, and I can help you answer any specific questions of how to submit work. Um, the, uh, you know, the students, especially the medical students, are assigned a submission, and I was in clinic just yesterday with a medical student who was looking for a submission, and David Dries over, overheard our conversation and said, well, I've got surgical videos, traction testing on a strabismus case, pre and post strabismus photos that I, I, would, I think would be a great resource. Uh, and so he just handed them to the student who's going to write them up. Ethan is so helpful in putting together and editing videos. So with you, utilizing a student who needs the publication for um, being competitive to, applicate, to apply to ophthalmology, it was a very easy process to get this uh, written up, and I think everybody benefits. So, um, the um, our future goals are: we just want these section editors to play a bigger role in uh, getting this populated. It's, the resource is only as good as its content, um, and we still have a long way to go before we really actually have all the sections populated. Um, we're also trying to clean it up so it's really just clinically relevant. Is David Myers here? I don't think he. David went through optics and really trimmed and went through everything that he thought would be just clinically relevant because it was originally outlined based on the BCSC which has um, some information that maybe not be as pertinent to this website if we're trying to just stay to what's kind of high yield. Um, we're also uh, kind of a, a mini spoiler alert. The, the resident lectures were, uh, there's a, a committee meeting to restructure how we do resident lectures. And, and you know the new movement is flipped classroom and, and having content available online and then the in-person time is mostly case-based interaction and discussion. Uh, if you're delivering a lecture but there's no interaction, it's just a delivery of content, that can be viewed online or before the actual interactive time together where um, you can use that up for more of a discussion. But right, of course, it's a great way to actually transition and pivot into that model. Um, and then we're just looking to uh, just populate anything that you have. Um, if we can get it submitted and packaged, peer reviewed and, and submitted, it's um, going to be a, just a real uh, amazing resource for the international work that we're doing. Um, where again, this is, I think, where maybe what some of the biggest benefit is, um, is to the places that we're trying to create centers, centers of excellence. They now have essentially an entire resident lecture series and a um, bunch of cases to review. A any questions or ideas or thoughts? So I have an idea, and I, I, I wish I wish that I had seen this before June thirteenth because we had mm. such fabulous lectures Content for the amazing. pediatric retina meeting, and it was you know a lot of people didn't go. Uh, we do have the keynotes that were video recorded, but if we had been able to video record lectures from experts throughout the world. I mean, it would have probably been one of the, you know, richest source of pediatric retina in the world. Yeah. And so uh, my question is, if we have, like, some kind of meeting like this in the future, do we have resources where we, Moran could do that? Because we didn't, we didn't really have it to, we didn't have the ability to video record everything uh, for the meeting. At least I don't, I don't think that was the case. So they, they only, we only ended up doing the keynotes. What a, is that of interest? Is that what a great thought. I think that would be, I mean, you just have to get permission for whoever's presenting. And then Ethan, um, our AV specialist, um, I guess that didn't even cross my mind either. That would have been just a phenomenal thing to do. We've got the equipment and the rest. I mean, it, it wouldn't just, have been a big deal, and it is a lost opportunity. And yeah. I'm like you and kick up myself. I, I should have also yeah. thought and, about that. And I would just say, if Moran can't do it for whatever reason, we've got the Eccles Health Sciences Library. They record all the cram sessions. They record a lot of lectures on campus and off campus. And uh, so there are some resources for future meetings that we should consider. The biggest problem is uh, the guest lecturer may or may not allow you to record them. And, and we do have to get permission from, 
when you have people come from the outside, you need permission from them to be able to record them and put it online. But um, I, I mean, I think this is if if somebody has a meeting that's upcoming, and you know, we can always look backward and say, oh my, but let's look forward and say, great, uh, next meeting you have Emmy, which I'm sure you'll have another one. Uh, we, <laughs> let's uh, let's try to get all that recorded. And other people who host meetings, we should be able to record those. Get those keynotes up there, though, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's a that's a great idea. Let's let's work with. Uh, uh, the conference center about that. But another thing, like we have two tremendous ophthalmologists coming as Benning lectures. So Mark Umayan, who developed a computer chip to be able to restore vision, and Gene Bennett, who basically is in the science for gene therapy in anything, right. ophthalmology, but anything. She was, a, you know, sort of the first, or spearheaded a lot of the work done for the first gene therapy um, treatment. They are coming. I didn't know if if we're able to somehow record or link with that, maybe potentially to the core. So the short answer is, I'm sure we can. The longer maybe there there may be some intricacies, but it's it's better to start looking at that now yeah. than later, or scramble at the last second. Mm -hmm. okay. That definitely needs to be worked on now. Yeah, I think I think we have a lot of design lectures that we pr potentially could implement as a part yeah. of the invitation to have them come. Just a form to explain them, you know, and their the process of recording and posting on our website and, and how they feel about it, and try to get a permission form ahead of time. I think it'd be a great idea. Um, any other thoughts or questions? Yeah, I'm going to try to meet with all the section editors. Uh, so, uh, if you can't uh, be available when I contact you about that, and then again, I think students. This is the summer season. We have a lot of rotating students who are looking for. Um, RAND core submissions. It's a, it's, a, it's a requirement on the rotation. So anything that you've recorded or an interesting case that you've seen or if we've got good images, um, try to catch a student and see if you can partner with them in, in getting it submitted. These are you know, really bright, uh, eager, and uh, energetic uh, people who, who uh, capable students who, who really are great at writing these up. And then also we want to do that for our own work as well as utilizing uh, uh, what we're doing. So, okay. Thanks, everybody. Do you have anything thank else? You. Thank you. No, I just want to thank everybody, but we love your ideas because it's your ideas that help us do a better job on the library committee. And um, the library committee is a really fun committee, and you, it's, you only meet every other month, and you're never bored. It's where pirate hats. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Thank you.